Are you guys ready to dive into the word tonight? Yes. So excited about uh, sharing with you tonight. And, and I think this subject is, is really near and dear to my heart. It's, it's something uh, really interesting, uh, something fun. And we're going to start together in, in, Deut- in Exodus, I'm sorry. Exodus chapter 40, um, ooh, chapter 4, verse 21. So if you have a Bible, let's see that. Let's go there. Exodus chapter 4, verse 21. In fact, I'm going to be reading three passages of Scripture tonight. They're going to be up on the screen, so, you know, you can just look up, but you can follow along on your phone. The first one, Exodus chapter 4, verse 21, it says, The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all of the wonders I have given you and the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Big part, of course, here is I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. And go with me to Ezekiel chapter 36. Here's the second passage we're going to read, again, about the heart. Ezekiel chapter 36, and we're going to begin reading in verse 26. And it says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the heart of stone out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And then the third scripture we're going to look at is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, our final scripture we'll read, and again about the heart. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Pray with me. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet, and it's a light unto our pathway. Simply, God, that means that your word brings light. Your word helps us see. And so, God, we love your word. We, 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 are, are, we cannot get enough of your word. It's, it's the greatest thing that we have. And so, Father, I pray that these words now become life-giving to us. God, that we can take these words from, from your word, from the Bible, and apply it to our lives. Help us to see. Help us to understand where you're taking us and what you're doing in our community. And finally, Lord, I pray that you will speak through me. Not for fame or reputation, but for someone to believe. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Time of message tonight is, is hard hearts. Is, is hard hearts. And, and I think every once in a while it's really important to kind of do a heart check. Right? To just kind of see where your heart is. I know something that my wife and I did and uh, do, and, and it's actually we talked about it in, in our married couple group is, is that we, we have these kind of state of the marriage addresses. We, we, we talk about where we are in our marriage. And instead of kind of reacting to what's going wrong, we, we like to, when we ain't fighting, right, in happy times, talk about some of the things that we like and some of the things we don't like. And, and we kind of go through this, but it's a, it's a constant kind of check of our hearts. That there might be some things that, that have gone unchecked for a little while, and, and sometimes when you leave things unchecked, uh, it's, it's important to kind of remind you to check on it. You know, recently I've been watching a, a lot of commercials, and it's because I'm watching a show that's on demand, and I can't fast forward to commercials. Come on, somebody. You don't know, know what I'm talking about? Because usually I fast forward to commercials because I recorded it. But, you know, if, and on these commercials, uh, there was a bunch of them, and they were all about kind of checking on the mental health of people. I don't know if you've seen these, right? It's like, you know, call someone, embrace the awkward, right? See how people are doing. Because people might be going through some difficult things and some some hard things. I think it's important every once in a while to kind of check your heart. How is your heart and and what's going on with your heart? The heart's a difficult organ. It's an organ that that we have to guard, but but it's something that, as you see, can, can become hardened. And so it's almost like we have to make sure that, that this heart that God's given us stays soft and, and, and firm, but, but not become too hard. What I find interesting about this passage of Scripture is, is that here in, actually, uh, we looked at it in Proverbs chapter 4. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So, so your heart is kind of where everything flows from. And so you really want to check how your heart is because that's kind of how everything is. If you're looking at responses or or if you're reacting to things or if you're struggling in certain areas, 
My suggestion is, is to check your heart. What is it that you're letting in your heart? Because what comes out of your heart is what you put into your heart. And so if you're putting a lot of things in your heart that maybe aren't pleasing to the Lord or maybe just are part of this world, and and then you're going through difficult seasons, what's going to come out is that difficult stuff you've been putting in. And so you have to be careful and you, you have to guard it because everything flows from it. But then it kind of leads to this interesting passage uh, that we looked at with Exodus and Moses. And and this story of Moses is is interesting, especially because, uh, as we know, the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And so Pharaoh was going to let the people go, or at least Moses came to Pharaoh with the thought to let the children of Israel go. They've they've been in slavery for over 400 years, and, and so now he comes and says it's time to let them go. And the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, which is a difficult passage to to read and to even consider, because then God kind of gets mad and sends these 10 plagues at Egypt, and and the last plague culminating in the death of every firstborn Egyptian child. And so this plague ended harshly. It it wasn't something that went well, but, but yet the reason that he sent the plagues almost seems like it's because God said he hardened his heart. I mean, if God says, I'm going to harden it, then why is he upset that he doesn't let those children go? Anybody ever had that thought? You ever ever wondered this? It's not just me. It's an interesting passage of scripture. And I think there's a couple things that we have to learn about this to even grasp and get about the human heart. First one is that the idiom or, or the saying that God hardened Pharaoh's heart is much better translated uh, that God allowed his heart to be hardened. And I think the, the beginning parts of kind of breaking this scripture down is, is that maybe in the beginning, God was allowing Pharaoh to harden something that, that was already happening in him, that, that maybe he had something to do with the hardening of his heart. It, now, 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 that could start to answer the question, but, but then it kind of leaves it uh, up to just a debate of why would he do it or why would he even allow it? Now, there's a Hebrew word that I want to introduce to you, uh, and it's a weird word. I'm going to put it up on the screens uh, so that you can see it. It's ahazek. Everybody say ahazek. This ahazek word is the word here used in Exodus chapter 4 that we read. And it's the word we read that's to harden. However, there's more to that word. The word does mean to harden, but the literal translation of ahazek in Hebrew is, is to strengthen And so, maybe this passage of scripture should better be read, or could better be read, that God allowed Pharaoh's heart to be strengthened. That there was some sort of strengthening that happened in Pharaoh that led to his heart becoming hard. I'm going to bring Ramey up right now, because I want to talk about this together with her. So why don't we give it up for Ramey as she comes. Hi guys. Thank you. All right. All right. You're bringing me up here to talk about why does it matter or why would God even strengthen Pharaoh's heart? Yeah, when you see this word, God strengthened his heart or God hardened his heart. Uh, what does it say to you? And, I, and, and th- let me kind of give you one of the reasons why I want Ramey to be up here. I, I, I teach uh, as well at Youth with a Mission. I'm, I'm a part of the staff that kind of teaches students uh, for YWAM. I don't know if you've heard of YWAM, but if you don't, it's a great organization to join if you want to learn something about it. But uh, while I was there, there was a question posed about this. How could God harden someone's heart and then be upset that they're hardened, <laughs> right? Uh, and and you, you had something that was really good, so... Why don't you do that? Yeah, so what's funny to me is um, this scripture doesn't really bother me. And I understand why it bothers so many people. Me, my whole life. (laughs) But it doesn't bother me (laughs) because when I read this scripture, I say, I'm probably looking at it from the wrong perspective, right? I'm probably not seeing this all the way, the way that God sees it. And for me, I'm saying, how does God see Pharaoh? 
Hmm. Right? Because Farrell can automatically be seen as the bad guy, because he is, yeah. right? But also, Pharaoh's one of God's children, ultimately, right? So God is also pursuing Pharaoh. So why would God strengthen somebody like Pharaoh? Well, because his heart, God's heart is always towards all of us. Even right. in our worst situations, God's heart is always towards us. So then I have to back up and say, okay, well, wow, possibly, maybe the Lord was strengthening his heart for him to make a different decision. Right? So there's 400 years of slavery. Mm. Pharaoh is not new. This Pharaoh is new to the Pharaoh game, but the Pharaoh game is not new. Right? right? And so for 400 years, we have had the Egyptians in slavery, the, the um, Israelites. Israelites in slavery for 400 years. So in order for Pharaoh to possibly m even make a decision to let the children of Israel go. He which, would, which, pause, side note, was more than just letting slaves go, but it, was, it rocked their economy, right? Yeah. It, it, it shook everything they were. So it went from the highest power in the earth to not because the, the slavery didn't just, they didn't just lose the Israelites, they lose gold, they lost properties, and they, they lost a lot in this letting go. Yeah, so Pharaoh would have had to be strengthened to even consider doing something so radical and different. And for me, it brings me to a story in my life where for five years of our marriage, Mike was sick. Chronic pain for five years. Yeah. Within that five years, we had three children. Yeah. So here I am, I get married, we wait almost three years to start having children, and we're finally having children, but my husband is constantly unavailable due to a sickness. So I've done everything I felt like. And I got <laughs> sick in ministry got, while in missions. He got sick was, during was, missions in India. I was in India and, and got never sick recovered. And, and couldn't recover, yeah. And so here I am thinking I'm doing everything the way that the God, the way that the Lord intended it. I get married, we have children, and here I am feeling kind of like a single mom. <laughs> you know, here I am feeling like I'm having to do this on my own. And there was a strength that had to come. There was a strengthening that God had to do in my heart. It was like God had to say, in order for you to go through this tough season, in order for you to get through this tough situation, I'm going to give you a strength. I'm going to give you a strength to make hard decisions, to not be resentful towards your husband. I'm going to give you a strength to make hard decisions, to get up every morning and be the mother that I've called you to be, even though your husband is unavailable. I'm going to give you the strength to walk through this season of five years of sickness with a husband and come out still being loving, still being uh, available, still being compassionate. That is what God was trying to walk me through. So there was a strength that God was giving me, but it was, it was hardening. Yeah. I, there was a hardness. There was a callus that was built through the strength that God was giving me. So it's almost as if God used the strength to do something in us. And I think and, we all have that. Yeah. We all have that option right. in times. We yeah. all have the option to say, am I going to use this strength that God has given me to get through this season, or am I going to let this strength that God has given me make me stony? Am I going to do the stony stuff like that scripture says? It's yeah. like, he wants to give us a heart of flesh, but we have this heart of stone. And sometimes I think we allow the strength that God has given us to become stony, yeah. which can't produce life. Yeah. Stones produce no life, yes. and that's the issue. Yes, stones produce nothing. You know, it's kind of like it's kind of like when you break an arm or you break a bone, right? And, and I, I've never broken any bones in my body because I'm perfect. But besides that, right? I mean, you know, I can't be in a sling. I ain't one of them. I'm too, you know, it's just I'm me, right? But but if you break a bone, what they say to the rest of the people that break, and I'm sure there's been uh, you people have broken things, but you know. <laughs> What they say is that it's very, very difficult to re-break that same place, right? And it's because there is a strength or a hardening that happens in that bone now that makes it more difficult to re-break something. So there is a strength that comes in a weak spot in order for you to get through something that you need to get through in that season. Yeah, and I think that there may be some of you guys like me that are in a season where you feel like you're getting hardened but you feel like you're going through this situation and the Lord is right beside you. So how can you be getting this strength 
and still be walking so closely with the Lord. And it's because we're seeing it sometimes in a negative way, that the strength that God has given us is the stony heart, and it's not. He's never giving us a stony heart. He is strengthening in us and building us up to get through some tough situations. But then we have to be very careful as to not make that a heart of stone. And I think that there's two ways yeah, that you good. can do that. So I think, number one, the first thing that I had to really do through that season that was really hard for me is I really had to fix my eyes on him, right? The scripture says in Psalms 121, I will look to the hills where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth, right? So elevating your eyes above your problem, elevating your eyes above the situation, looking to the hills where your help comes from and keeping your eyes on him, never looking down to the problem or the situation or in allowing that to be your vision. Only allowing your vision to be whatever his vision is, is one of the biggest ways that you will not allow your heart to be stony and allow your heart to still be strengthened yeah. and, and, and in a way that you can still carry on. But as soon as we kind of lean towards the other way where we start to look at just the problem and looking at just the situation that we're in, now all of a sudden we're starting to get those stones. Yeah, I, I think what's really cool is that in Israel, where, where the temple is in Jerusalem, it, it's, it's up on a hill. Yeah. And so when you come into the city, they, they say, I've never been, but you have to look up to where the temple is. And, and so it was almost like physically look to the hills yeah. where your help comes from. Don't look around to what's broken. Look to where your help comes. And, and so a lot of times, uh, part of why we're, we're bogged down by issues or our hearts becoming hardened is because we're focusing on the issues rather than focusing on the one who can fix it. Yeah. And focusing on the one who, who knows why you are where you are. And, and there's a process and a reason that you're even going through that. Maybe there's a strengthening yeah. that's happening in you to go through a tough season that's good for you. But, but you have to be very mindful to focus on him during that season. Yeah. And the second thing I would say that kept me was leaning. <laughs> leaning only on him. That's good. Right? So we know that the word says in um, Proverbs 3-5, I think it is, yeah. that uh, lean not on your own understanding, yeah. right? In all your ways, acknowledge him. He's going to make your path straight. So for me, it's that lean in really signifies that We're really wanting in, to like hear. It's yeah. really that, that you're really adjusting your ears to hear him constantly because sometimes we get, we miss it and we get off the mark. And so that lean in is really that constant adjusting, that constant saying, okay, Lord, I really want to follow your voice for every single step, not just the next step, but the step after that. And not just the big, huge steps, but the little tiny steps yeah. in between. And that's huge. We, sometimes we only go to God with the big, huge questions of life, but God wants us to ask him in every single tiny step, all the steps he wants to be a part of it. He wants to have approval in them. He wants to make our path straight for us. So I feel like if we fix our eyes on him, if we just focus on him, because he's where our help comes from, and if we lean in and tune in to his spirit, listening to his voice, even though you're going through a season that's difficult, even though you're going through a season where he's strengthening you and he's building you up, you will not gather stones in your heart. You won't become a heart of stone. You'll remain a heart of flesh if you do those two things. But you have to, you have to stay fixed on him and you have to stay tuned into what he's saying. You know, that kind of tuned in part, it kind of reminds me of when the kids whisper because they really suck at it. I don't know if anybody has people that are really bad whispers or, you know, and they just, they don't whisper well. Like you gotta, your whispers gotta be low, but it's gotta also be a little loud. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, you can't be too loud or it's not a whisper, because I hate those people too. That'd be like, oh yeah, and I was like, why are you all up in my ear yelling, right? <laughs> and they whisper yell, and then your ear starts burning, and then you want to just itch it. Does it, anybody, that's just me? Okay, but, but when my kids whisper, they suck at it. Can I say that in church? Yes. I already said it twice, right? Yes. It's too late, right? Yes. I mean, no, they're not they're good awesome. at it. They're so awesome. you almost want to be like, what? I, I know I do. I'll be like, what? And, and what I do is, is that I lean towards them, yep so that it helps to hear what's being said. Yep. And I think a lot of times when we're going through hard times with God, we're so frustrated that we just want to stay here. Yep. We don't want to move. We don't want to lean. It's like when you're sick. You don't want to move. You don't want to do anything. And so in the midst of it, you want to just stay where you are and be like, God, fix it. God, fix it. And he's whispering, and we're not leaning, 
And, and we're not tuning and we're not trying to hear what he's doing or why he's doing it or what process he's taking us through. We want to stay solid and firm in where we are. Yeah. And that's why we become hard. We become stony. We become uh, fruitless, if you will, yeah. because, because a, a, a branch that is hard can still produce fruit, but a stone produces nothing. Yeah. And so what we have to be careful of is, is we want the strength, but we don't want the stone. But we don't want the stone. And, and so what stone. I would tell you is that there are seasons in your life where God is sending strength. It might even seem like it's a hardening, like a hard heart is coming over you. And, and maybe he's doing it to block some things and to protect you from some things or, or to even keep sanity in the middle of really difficult seasons. Yeah. I, I know people that have gone through chemotherapy or something like that, something where, where you, even your life was a risk and there was something, maybe even it's an accident or something happened and, and there had to be a hardness that kind of came in that so that you can get through that season, yeah. so that you can be strong through that, yeah. what's going on. But, but in the midst of that, what happens is if you take your focus off him yep. and if you stop leaning in, that strength he sends can start to become stony. And that's what happened with Pharaoh. Yeah. Pharaoh was built to be a man of strength, to be a man that could let the people go, yeah. that could actually say, yes, I'm going to let them go. And ultimately, he did. He went against everyone in Egypt and did let the children of Israel go. And there was a strength that God needed him to have to do that, but Pharaoh made it about himself. Right. And so it became stony and hardened, and so every time it says that Pharaoh was hardened, and he stayed hardened and got worse as it went on. And all through Scripture, you see how God allows his heart to be hardened because of the strength that he had. Yeah, that's it. That's it. You got, said got, it. Give it up for Ramey, y'all. <laughs> Give it up for Amy. Thank you. I got you. That was so good. <laughs> give it up one more time for Amy, y'all. Look, if y'all want her to come up more, y'all gonna have to real give it up for her. Because you act like she always up here. Y'all like, yeah, that was all right. That was good. That's why she don't come up here, because y'all don't appreciate her. What she do? No, I'm joking. No, I'm really happy. And to do it on your birthday, and you look all cute up here talking, <laughs> looking over, look, turning your head, your thing staying perfect. You ever know that joint don't move at all? Like, you talk about hard hearts. You got a hard bun. Come on, somebody. You got that hardened bun. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> and so, here we are, right? <laughs> Let's bring it back. Come on, man, focus, right? No. The truth is, is that we all go through hard seasons. And, and, and what I wanted to tell you, and I, I want you to hear me, is that, is that th there is hard seasons that we all go through. And, and it's not because you did something negative or wrong. It's not something you did that, that God is punishing you for. This is not God being the agent of evil things because he can't do that. And he doesn't do that. And so when you see God perhaps doing something that you would say, that sounds evil. That sounds harsh. Maybe there's something that you're not seeing about that because that's not who God is. In the midst of all that, you need to hear that, that yes, there is a firmness. There is a strength. There is a hardening that God is, is sending you that's doing to you to, to get through certain things. But guys, the end of the story is that God healed me. And, and, and at the end of that story, I, I'm not sick anymore. And so there are some things that, that even Ramey in that season had to be strong in, had to even become hardened in, where now that I'm well, she now has to kind of change a bit, right? Where, where, where I was weak before, now I can be strong again, and so she doesn't have to have that same strength she once had. And so in the midst of that, sometimes in your hardness, you actually realize that God is trying to do something else, that God is trying to also Maintain something about your heart and keep it uh, a heart of flesh that can be used. So what I want to share is, is four ways. Uh, four ways that will uh, be about softening your heart and, and, and allowing your heart to be moldable, usable. I mean, the scripture in Ezekiel says that I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put in you. And I will take away the heart of stone out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. What's so awesome about that scripture is that God's the only one that made a heart, and so he's the only one that, re that can remake a heart. And so often we're looking at other people to mend broken hearts. 
So, so what we do is we're heartbroken, so we try to get another person to mend that broken heart, and we end up with an even more broken heart. The only one that can mend a broken heart is the one that made a heart in the first place. And so his desire for you is to remove that heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. But how do you do it? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you four ways, and then we're going to be done, and we're going to worship, and we're going to have a good time, okay? There are four ways that I think you need, important things that you need as you're going through this. You've gone through a strong season, and you've been hardened in your heart in certain times, but now God is saying, it's time for you to soften your heart so that you can hear me. Because you might thought that you were being hard or strong for this season, but God is saying that in order to really trust me, to hear me, you need to have a softened heart. Well, the first thing you need, number one, is to stay connected to the vine. John 15, 15 is one of my favorite passages of scripture, right? It says, if I, I am in you and if you are in me, you remain in me. And if in you, we can do much things. We can do many things. If you are connected to the vine, if you are a part of him, then you can produce fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so part of that is staying connected to the vine. Now, 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 if you're connected to a tree, a branch on a tree, uh, uh, although it's hard and strong, it's also still flexible. It's bendable. And, and those are the branches that can produce fruit. And then the fruit grows, it actually will bend on that tree. And although that tree uh, is really strong, it will bend really well. In fact, a part of the way we know it's strong is that it can be flexible. It can bend. It can be moved. And then it can go back and forth. God doesn't want us weak. But he wants us pliable, flexible, moldable, and still movable at times. And so in order to do that, you got to stay connected to the vine. There's a difference between a, a vine that comes from a tree that produces fruit and a stone on the ground. Both are hard. Both are, are, are hard in sub things, uh, you know, materials. But, but, but one of them produces life and the other produces nothing. you got to stay connected, number one. The second thing you need is you got to admit your wrongs. You have to be able to admit when you are in the wrong. And I find the hardest thing for people that struggle with hard hearts is that they have pride now even about where they are. They're frustrated about why they're there, and so because of that frustration, it, it, it keeps you firm in what you are. It keeps you hardened and upset. And because of that, you, you can't admit your wrongs. James 5, 16 says, if you confess your sins, confess your sins one to another. There is something about speaking out what you're supposed to do. You know, it's interesting because when Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible says that you can see, if you look there in Genesis chapter 3, you can look uh, when you go home. But when Adam and Eve took from that fruit and ate it, God comes down out of heaven and says, where are you? And the Bible says that Adam and Eve were hiding in the trees. Which I find fascinating because the trees was the source of their sin. So it's almost as if they ate from that tree, committed that sin, then hid in the sin. And it's what we do. Instead of addressing that you did something wrong, you're upset that someone found out. Well, who told you? How do you even know? Why are you in my business like that? See, this is what's wrong with the church. Everybody's always in my business. No. See, you're not admitting your wrongs. You're trying to hide in your trees. What God is saying is that you have to acknowledge, yes, I'm flawed. Yes, I've made a mistake. Yes, I've broken. And now there's something that I have to do. In fact, I'm going to give you four ways uh, of repentance. And I love this. It's, it's actually, uh, the, the, in, in, in Hebrew, it's called teshuva. It's the whole idea of repentance or returning back to God. It's what it literally means. Uh, but there's four steps to this, and I'll give them to you. Number one, you turn from your sin. You have to be an acknowledged turning from the sin. Now, we're not hiding in the sin, we're turning from it. We're acknowledging, look, that's not the way I need to go, and I need to go a different direction. One of the best things I say to young people that are struggling in bad habits, they say, Pastor Mike, I have a really bad habit, and I'm trying to fight it. Do you know what the best thing you can do is? Get a better habit. Instead of trying to say, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this, well, how about start doing some things that you do want to do? How about you start reading your word and start putting some things into practice? How about you start loving on God and reading some books about where you are to try to strengthen where you are? You have to turn from where it is in order to begin the process of healing. 
Number one, you got to turn from your sin. Number two, you got to regret that sin. You can't act like, oh, well, I've done this enough, now it's nothing. In fact, the most dangerous place to be in sin is to feel like it doesn't matter anymore. It's probably the most dangerous place we can get to as young people where we're committing a sin so often that we now feel like, eh, it's just what it is. It is what it is. God understands. He, looks, he loves me through it anyway. And the minute you turn from that regret, th- th- then it starts to become a part of you. It starts to be easier to keep walking down that same path. Do you want to know what made David so unique? Because he was a sinner worse than many sinners that you read in the Bible. In fact, if you're going to compare sin, yo, I have never killed nobody and I never thought to. David did. <laughs> so, so if you're going to compare a sinner, then, then David could beat most of us in this room. What was the difference between David and us? Well, well, David is a man that God said is after his heart. And it's because every time he sinned, there was a full regret in him, a full contrition, meaning that he knew that he was wrong and he didn't hide it, he acknowledged it to God and he took it all. And if you read the Psalms, you see, you see David going through those sins and saying, yes, I did that, but that's not who I am. Yes, I walked that way, but God, you're better. And there has to be a level of regret that, that we have for our sin. The most dangerous place, again, that you can be is in a place of indifference. And if you're there, it's because your heart has become stony now to it. God is saying, I need to replace that heart. And I need to do something in it. Number three, now you got to confess it, right? Turn from the sin, regret the sin, now confess that sin. That means that there's somebody that you need to talk to about it. Now, now in, in YWAM, they, they, they do this saying, and I love it so well, I've never heard it said better, but it's your circle of sin is your circle of repentance, right? So if, if you uh, had committed a sin with someone, then that repentance needs to happen with that person. But, but if the sin happened with just you, maybe in your mind, th- then you just have to repent to just you. Does that make sense? And, and so that, that repentance or that forgiveness now is connected to what you need to be doing better with God. Uh, but if it involves another person, then that needs to be someone that you call and talk to. If you and your girlfriend or boyfriend are, are struggling maybe in an area then, and you fall, then that confession needs to happen every time. I regret that, that we did that. I don't want to do that anymore. That's not what we want to become. So we have to acknowledge it and confess it. And then number four, and I think this is the biggest one is accept your forgiveness. I think the hardest thing we do is not those first three. I think the first three, as a true believer, you'll say, I am there, Pastor Mike, I'm there. But that fourth one is so big to this whole idea of forgiveness. In fact, the Bible says something, that's not even up here, but the Bible says something about God that is crazy. It says God removes our sins from us. And he says that as far as the east is from the west is as far as he has removed our sins from us. How far is the east from the west, guys? The answer is is an infinite amount. There's no number you can say that that distance, it's 20,000 miles. No, it's forever in each direction, meaning that God has the ability to remember your sins no more. So that means that if you've confessed and you've, con- you've done those things and you're now continually bringing up to God sins you've committed years in the past, what, what you're doing is reintroducing to God something that he's already forgotten. Urgh. You're, you're now saying, well, God, well, well, what about what I did here? What about what I did there? And God is saying, I removed that from you. Why are you still there? And forgiveness is what empowers you to now be able to stand firm for the next trial. Because the minute you stop forgiving yourself and feel like you're broken and you're, you're not good enough, it becomes easy to keep falling into the same areas of sin. you got to confess your sins. you got to acknowledge it. And God will then remove this, this heart of stone. Number three is you got to connect with like-minded people. Yo, and this is huge. It's why this huge campaign we're on about 21 small groups in 2021. It's not because it sounds cool, although it do sound kind of cool, right? It's not about that. It's, it's more about finding people that will strengthen you in this journey. Hebrews 10, 24 says, let us consider how to stir, one and up, uh, stir up one another to love and good works. 
Ah, say that again. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Guys, how many of your friends are stirring up things to evil? They're stirring you up to more anger, stirring you up to frustration, stirring you up to anxiety. They triggers, and, and, and that stir up is usually something negative, or you're, you end up gossiping or end up having something negative to say. Well, what if we found some good, like-minded people that are stirring us up to love and good works? Do you have friends that are stirring you up to love and good works? Because if you don't, then, then your heart's going to remain hardened. You're going to stay where you are, but you've got to get around people that are going to say, that's not, I, I know you went through that, but God has more for you. I, I know that might be your story, but why don't you start praying for others? How about not just focusing on your issue and, and start looking to the issues of others? There is something about joining a group that, that, that makes and takes the attention off of your issues and onto what you're doing collectively. And God does something in that. And so I would say, join a group if you've gone through or you're struggling with a stony heart. And then finally, number four, and I love this, you got to worship. you got to worship. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. What I love about worship is, is, is that worship, it, it aligns you with him. It, it puts you in the right perspective of God in you. Because in worship, you're not thinking about your pride or your hardened heart. Your, your focus now is on him. And what I believe it does is worship disarms pride, which is what leads to stony hearts. And, and it disarms it because you change your focus off of yourself and onto Jesus. I, I believe that, that, that there is some work that we have to do. And I believe that it's, it's work that's, that's doable. But, but, but there's a couple things we got to remember. Number one, you got to stay connected to the vine, right? You got to stay connected to him. You got to admit your wrongs and fight for repentance. Fight for teshuva in Hebrew, which is to return to God. Number three, you have to find like-minded people. It's the only way that your heart is going to turn from stony back into the way that he wants it to. And then finally, it's worship. And I love that we end on worship because we're about to do worship. But there's something about worship that, that just, it really just disarms hardened hearts. It breaks some things. And anybody that's really gone through some hard things in life, most of us that have know the power of worship. Guys, in those five years when I was sick, I was in and out of the hospital maybe four or five times a month, uh, all the time. In a bad month, I would go two or three times a week. Just in the ER, didn't know what it was. The doctors did every test in the world and never found anything. So I would just lay in the bed knowing that, listen, I don't know what it is and I don't know what's going on, but, but everything I ate couldn't keep down and, and I was losing weight and everybody was getting nervous and, and I didn't. You know why I didn't get nervous? It's because I fell in love with worship. It was in that season of my life that I started digging into the word harder than I ever have in my life. And the reason I'm standing up before you today, guys, is because God, uh, through that season, taught me something. He strengthened my heart. So now worship is just a part of me. Digging into the word is just a part of me. In fact, when I get off of that, I start feeling unaligned and broken. We got to get to a place where worship becomes who you are. And let me just tell you this. If you don't like worship, you're probably in the wrong place because we're going to do it for eternity. So, so, so this is a good place to learn to love it. <laughs> To learn to practice it. Now, I will say that worship is more than music. It's a lifestyle, so there's that. But, but there is something about surrendering it all in a worship service. Not caring what you carried in here. Not caring what people around you might look like or think about. Not even caring if they're looking at you acting a fool. Worship will bring you to a place where he can fix what's wrong in you. Can we align ourselves? Can we take out this 
heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. Bow your head, close your eyes, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you that you said in your word that you have given us everything we need for life and godliness. What that means, God, is that there's nothing missing, nothing broken in us. We're whole in you. And so, God, my prayer is, is not for you to bring in something from the outside to put in us. It's to activate what's already inside of us. For, God, you have put this void in us that can only be filled with, with you. We can only be filled with worshiping you and giving you our all. Lord God, I pray that we will stop trying to fill that void with other things. That we'll stop trying to, to just get by and to be okay, but we truly give everything to this God. Because God, we know that you're the only one that can mend a broken heart. Now right now, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I, I really feel like this altar call is, is for everyone. You're either in a place where God is strengthening or hardening your heart through a tough season, or, or you've gone through some tough seasons and now God is trying to, to, to soften or to take out that stony heart. No matter where you are, I believe that we're all in a place where we have to be really mindful of what's happening in our hearts. So what I want you to do is while your head is bowed and eyes are closed, I want you to just lay hands on your heart. Everybody just... Lay your hands on your heart. And I'm just going to do a prayer with you. First, I, I want you to repeat after me because I want you to pray this prayer out loud. And, and then after that prayer, I'm going to pray for you. But just repeat after me. Say, Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving you us. Or giving us you, Lord. We thank you, God that you have made our heart. Now, God, I pray that you will help my heart. Help me to guard my heart. Help me to protect my heart. And God, help me to give you my all with my heart. With my full heart, Lord, I give you worship tonight in Jesus name now God I pray for every single person that's under the sound of my voice I pray God that you will do heart surgery tonight that you are right now going into hearts God and and you're removing scales and and, and stones that have built up over years of bitterness and resentment and anger and frustration and confusion God I know you're doing it right now in Jesus name I, I thank you for that heart right now that you're mending God, we might have even said that our heart will never be the same, that because of what we've gone through, because of how much they hurt me, because of how much I've gone through, I'll never be the same. God, I curse that right now in Jesus' name. And I pray, God, that you will loose your love and your blood that will flow through us, that will enable us to do everything that you've called for us to do. God, not our power and not by what we want, but by your spirit, Lord. And so we trust in you. We fix our eyes on you and we lean into you, knowing, God, that you're doing something in us. And finally, Lord, I thank you that you have given us worship. It's a way for us to give you all of our heart. And so, God, I pray that you will take over this time. Let this be a time of healing, let this be a time of transformation. Let this be a night of heart surgery. Do it in us during worship, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.